Amazing. So we're, we're at the final share what you know, masterclass session on, um, IP patents and branding for health tech med tech startups uh, in collaboration with Neutromics. I'm Peter Birch, for those that don't know from Talking Health Tech. And we've been running these sessions basically once every two weeks or so uh, as uh, something for the THT Plus community, but also opened up to others that might be of uh, find it interesting too. So it's been great to have Rosie do a deep dive with special guests from time to time, but Rosie's definitely led us through those sessions, um, you know, all the way. So I'm going to introduce Rosie and Eliza who are on the panel for this session today. And, um, you know, we've got some people who are attending live and there'll be a couple more. I expect we'll also roll in throughout the session. We're doing it as a meeting. So feel free to uh, have cameras on or off. It's up to you. Um, if you want to ask a question, usually putting it in the chat as we go is handy, but also it's we, we did it deliberately as a meeting to make it a bit more collaborative. Feel free to jump in with a question um, as we go. Just unmute yourself. If you're not talking, then go on mute. Um, so that's what we're doing. And this, this particular session we're doing is to is basically to, is like the capstone session, the one to, to round out the series that we've done. Um, and let me just add in a couple more people in. So it's been uh, great to have those. The previous sessions we've done so far have been, you know, with slides. And today we don't have any slides. It's more akin to, you know, a panel or a, even a podcast session. We might repurpose this conversation into a podcast episode too. So um, look, Rosie, thank you so much for, for taking us through all of the Share What You Know sessions about, um, you know, the patents, branding uh, and IP. So, um, and thanks again for coming today. You're welcome. Um, for those that don't know Rosie, Rosie's the head of commercial and uh, intellectual property strategy, innovation and growth uh, and a patent attorney uh, <laughs> and has a dog. Uh, and <laughs> she's at Neutromics, I should say. So um, that's... Uh, it's been great to have you take us through these sessions. Um, we've also got joining us today, Eliza Saunders. Eliza is special counsel at DLA Piper, specialist IP lawyer, um, has got particular focus and experience in the life sciences sector, also a patent attorney, and uh, plenty of experience across the health tech sector and advising in that space. So, you know, those that are interested in the software as a medical device side of things and, and a bit in relating to software, Eliza's got all the, no, she doesn't say all the answers, but we'll, we'll be able to touch on some of those things today uh, in the session, hopefully. Um, we've got people who are attending in the audience. And like I said, they might drop in and out. We also have quite a few people who watch these in the Talking Health Tech community at Weird and Wonderful Hours. Um, so that's, uh, we'll, we'll keep those people in mind too. So thanks again. Now, look, Rosie, if you were to then kind of summarize for anyone who hasn't attended the last four sessions, you know, it, it doesn't have to feel like they're watching the season finale of their favorite TV show and missed all of it. And now it doesn't make any sense. So if you were to give them the steamroller kind of perspective scene setter of, you know, from a health tech or med tech startup point of view, particularly for a founder, why is it so important that we've spent, you know, four or five sessions on this topic around protection of IP branding and, uh, and related topics. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, look, we did the sessions, we did sort of basic one-on-one patterns, branding and trademarks, um, licensing and IP strategy, because IP is very important to startup companies. It's, you do it um, because it gives it value to the company, um, investors look towards it. And it's, it's a, you know, unique sort of area that not a lot of people are familiar with. So we wanted to give them, you know, a bit of the basics, things to look out for when you're licensing, how to, things to consider when you do an IP strategy and sort of make them a bit more familiar and at least comfortable going forward. So it was to give back to the community hmm. um, in that sense. And I do, you know, if IP is something that we're, you're looking at, um, really do recommend you go back to those sessions. And if you have any questions, you're still free to reach out to me. Yeah. And so I know, um, Eliza, we've got a good mix of, you know, people in the community who operate in, I guess, the when we say health tech or, you know, technology and healthcare can be remarkably broad. Um, we've got 
quite a few operating in the software side of things and you know developing software or utilizing data when it comes to healthcare so um, from a an early stage founders perspective some of the things you know from your side what are some of those things that those founders should be thinking about if they are dealing with patient data when it comes to the sort of that we've been talking about today, which is the protections and the um, getting the ducks in a row for, for the business when it comes to IP branding patterns and everything like that. Thanks, Peter. Well, I won't profess to be a um, IT expert and um, any anyone who's wanting to, to ensure the protections are up there, the IT and data and things, they, they really should get specialist advice. But but certainly what we're seeing in, in the health tech space uh, from an IP perspective and generally from a legal perspective is that most of the innovation centers around the use of, use of data and thereby the use of software in the application of, of healthcare to, to, to patients. And so number one thing for us is, 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 is really what is, uh, what, what are you protecting and is the software patentable uh, and the different jurisdictions uh, reach dif different outcomes mm -hmm. um, but but generally uh, fr from a patent perspective if, if 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 the software is actually having an in improvement in the technology of, of the computer and there is some new technical effect in the substance of the invention that's being patented then it really is um, worth considering uh, patent protection. Mm. Uh, otherwise, you're left to, to copyright, which, which, as we know, can be reverse engineered, or we're left to trade secret, which can be revealed in the code anyway. Um, or, or otherwise, you're sort of looking at trying to be first to market, really, yeah. and get the contracts. And I think about, you know, a lot of the times on the podcast or in the community when we've talked about um, when you start involving legal aspects when it comes to data, often it's to do with the safe and secure treatment of the, 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 the information, which is obviously very important. And that's, not, you know, we've, we've covered that a lot and we'll continue to cover that a lot on the podcast. But what we're really talking about here is the commercial protection side of things and from the business aspects where you're ensuring that you've got a you know, not just a viable and sustainable business, but a competitive business moving forward. Is that really the space that we're kind of speaking in right now? Yeah, I would say so. It's, it's not from an IP perspective. It's not, it's not, it's not always, it's not straightforward. You know, I, I regard health tech as, as, as covering very, there's various aspects, isn't it? From um, the clinical, enhancing the clinical treatment to just general health and wellness, um, to the efficiencies of the business and, and all those different areas can be protected in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly uh, a competitive advantage is, is achieved uh, by, through IP or, or at least appropriate um, protection of confidential information mm -hmm. in, in early stage development. And Rosie, you know, you know, you know the drill um, in startup life, there's competing priorities and limited resources of time and money, um, you know, and we're talking about protecting patents and trademarks and working out branding and everything. And whenever you say to me, let's go in depth about some legal issues and considerations, going in depth with a lawyer sounds expensive. So um, where, where would you prioritize your time and like, thinking about those legal aspects as a, as an early stage startup company, because what we've learned through these sessions is not something you want to leave until later to deal with it. You want it, you don't want to deal with it now, but at the same time, you've got limited resources and time and effort to be able to do it. So how would you go about thinking about that strategy and involving, you know, protecting all this stuff? Well, I think you need to identify or just have that, take that time out to think about it and find out what you can protect and what you might not be able to protect, even if you are just Googling around, if that's, you know, as much as your funds can handle. But if you can at least know what's protectable, um, know what your options are, and then have a plan and, and try and revisit that plan and work towards it. Um, you know, we always say, you know, protect early, but of course, as you said, you know, resources, particularly, you know, 
the budget may not be able to cope. So you have to identify what's the most key aspects to your business. What do you need to protect? What are the core features? And, and just slowly build from there. And if, as you know, as Eliza said, um, you know, confidential information, do everything you do, your research collaborations under confidentiality, try and keep it secret. Because once it's out in the public domain, you can't then go back and protect it. So, you know, you have this competing situation where you want to develop your product and you may want to get it out there, but if it's not protected, once it's out there, you can't go back and, you know, plug the gap. So mm -hmm. it is hard. It's a balancing thing, but you have to just manage it somehow. But I think knowing your options and knowing a bit about the IP space um, and what your options are is a good start. Awesome. I'll remind um, anyone who's attending live, you're welcome to drop something in the chat if you've got a question or also come off mute and um, feel free to ask that, uh, whether that's um, a specific question or something more general. Of course, there's only so much the information that can be provided in this type of session, but we'll certainly do our best to, to point things in the right direction. And if I think about, you know, for Eliza or Rosie, um, you know, those those early stage companies, often it's handy to have a checklist or a list of kind of resources or tools to be able to work with. Not everyone gets the, um, gets a great deal of guidance in setting up these things. Sometimes setting up the business is kind of organic and kind of, you know, it, it's, it's a good opportunity to reflect back at any time and see and make sure you've got all your kind of bits and pieces in line, whether it's contracts or protections or anything. Are there places that you normally refer people to in terms of you know, here's a good set of resources or tools or um, things that you can refer to as a, as a health tech startup to make sure you're all protected. Eliza, do you... Look, I can answer that. Um, certainly, um, I'm, I'm not wanting to advertise legal services, but DLA Piper has excellent resources for startups, uh, specialised websites, but um, they've just released a what's called a high growth startup pack um, that will be relevant to various jurisdictions but that startup pack uh, has relevant checklists and um, in, in fact goes through those essential documents that startups should have from the corporate documents in the uh, articles of association and shareholder agreements to the really important intellectual property documents so the non-disclosure documents intellectual property assignments, uh, collaboration agreements, and uh, particularly also the employment contracts and, and ensuring that IP is protected uh, appropriately um, and, uh, and, and adhered to by employees, particularly when they leave, as well as uh, things like terms of uh, um, website use and things for online, on, online um, marketing and advertising. And, and also, very importantly, privacy privacy policies and how data is being used within the organisation. I'll just add to that, Peter, that, you know, Liza pointed out and, and your community should be aware that, you know, what might be law here in Australia could be quite different overseas. And we know that a lot of startups look to overseas markets as their first market. Um, so, you know, it's not to make the assumption that how you approach think something in Australia, you might do the same approach in the US. You'd have to, you know, dig a bit deeper to see what the similarities or what the differences are in those, two, you know, two jurisdictions. So mm. just need to point that out. And just thinking about, you know, those different documents and and uh, contracts and, and materials that we were talking about, some of those things might not have changed in a very long time or just kind of, continue to evolve, you know, if I'm thinking employment contracts or, or other kind of bits and pieces, um, but are there any documents that have materially kind of changed a lot of what, like, are there any areas in particular you've seen like transformational change over the past couple of years that if someone was across it, you know, 10 years ago, they should really kind of refresh themselves with, I'm thinking potentially with more and more globalization that Rosie was suggesting, you know, that could be one element or are there any others? Well, look, I think all of the contracts probably generally develop over time because there's, there's always contentious issues and lawyers who are up to date in preparing those contracts will, will always be on top of how the clauses should be drafted in their particular jurisdiction based upon 
uh, recent law. Um, so I, I can't really advise um, specifically in relation to any, any one agreement, uh, but, but certainly uh, it, it, it probably with, with just the growth in tech generally, there is becoming a lot more availability of this sort of resource online um, from law firms like, like DLA Piper uh, that, that we put it out there and assist the clients up front with uh, what they need to, what they really need to have in place. Mm. Mm. And Peter, you know, from my experience working at Neutronics, which is in-house, is, you know, we have a, a confidentiality agreement template, but then you get them from other parties and the clauses are quite different or they might have certain sways in them to, to you know, one party or another party's advantage. So, you know, I'm going to say the word. Some of them are, no offence, Eliza, gobbledygook. But you've, <laughs> just got to, you've just got to work your way through it and um, and understand it, and if not, ask the questions and, and you know, work, yeah, just work your way through it and make, make sure it's, to, you know, into your favour, not so much into your favour, but you're not disadvantaged by it, but just, you know, read and understand what they what the terms mean um, you know and don't assume that they all have some standardized these are the basic clauses in there because they may not so something that stood out to me in some in one of the sessions in the past was um, you know in, in relation to IP and I know Natalie was going to be joining this session um, and at short notice she wasn't able to today so um, we might you know, be able to touch on this a little bit, but um, that's one that I think a lot of founders can get um, caught up on and in the complexities around the globalization and the fact that particularly if you're a piece of software, you're accessible from anywhere. And I'm not sure, Eliza, you come across dealing with the software side of things from time to time, but, you know, if you're, we, we spoke a little bit about it, but from your it's always good having different perspectives. If you're a, you know, health tech founder in Australia and, you know, potentially your solution could be used anywhere around the world, but Australia is your, your key market now, um, you know, how have you, what are some things that these founders should be thinking about in terms of making sure they've got those protections from the outset, particularly when it comes to IP or anything else? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, yeah, number one is whether whether what they have and, and what they've developed is, is can be protected by patents, um, because because if it's not, like copyrights automatic, trademarks obviously another area that you'd need to um, consider globally. What other trademarks are there before? Yeah, bye. Before you um launch your product, so um, yeah, really they are the main two things with determining whether you've got something patentable, in which case you should file a, uh, a PCT patent application uh, or, and what your product or service is going to be called and whether you want to trademark registration, which um, is, is, is a very valuable intellectual property right. It, it, and part of that really in, would involve obtaining searches global searches and just to see whether there's other names substantially identical or deceptively similar to, to what you would like to, mm. to register. And in as we might, I think we've spoken about in previous sessions, a lot of the marks in health tech that are chosen are can be quite descriptive. And descriptive, descriptive uh, trademarks are, are, are difficult to get registered and, and there are also far more prone to opposition by other players who might want to use the descriptive words as opposed to a distinctive trademark which uh, is not related to the goods or services that are being offered uh, for sale. Uh, so that's really important to, to, to get to do the searches and do you conduct your due diligence to ensure you can get good uh, secure trademark rights uh, globally but but from a patent perspective too, uh, you would want to, yeah, I, I, I think once you come get got advice from a, a specialist patent attorney in the field, so whether it's life, more life sciences or whether it's medical, whether it's more on the tech side, 
um, you really, the best advice I can give you is to, to, to get that, that, that advice from that specialist attorney um, who can really give you the advice at the outset, whether they genuinely believe that you have a, a, a patentable subject matter and, and, and a right that, that's worthy of protection um, globally. I, Rosie would, would, be, would, would, would be better um, equipped to advise in, in filing patents, but uh, it's, it's, it's a really, yeah, that, that, her, that good advice from the outset is absolutely critical. Yeah. And most attorneys won't charge you for that. They will charge you for drafting and filing, but if you see a good one from the start, they'll say, look, you could do this, this and that, but this is, they'll, 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 they'll give you the best advice they can. Yeah, so that, that's right, Eliza. I mean, generally in the profession, and I was in the profession for 30 years, you know, we call them general inquiries, but if a client came in and wanted to just talk, you know, about what they, what they think they've developed, that's usually, you know, a free consultation. So, and there's other resources that you, you may be able to find where you can get that consultation um, for free. So you could possibly do a number of them if you need lots of, you know, <laughs> lots to add up um, to get that advice. But I think the one thing is, as Eliza's pointing out, there's, there's different forms of IP and it's finding out which one is most suitable for what you have, what is it actually protecting? And we went through that in the first session. You know, a pattern is, a, is a, an invention, um, a, a trademark is a brand, so it's the name, it's not the product per se, um, copyright just in exactly what's there, um, you know, the software itself. So if it, I, I don't know what the percentage of changes or a lies would be able to say what that is, well, then probably I can in that area. But, you know, different forms of IP protect different things. So you need to really be aware of what you can do and what your options are. And, yes, it's, you know, you do need specialist advice. It, it's just how it is. But, it's you know, you can get some free advice to at least know what, what, where you stand and what you might need to work towards and, you know, um, get some grant money um, or investment and put it, put it to good use and have a plan. Yeah, and I'll just, what I'll just add to that is that I was, I was sort, of, sort of focusing on, on the patent attorneys. The patent attorneys, they're specialist scientists. With, you know, in, in the tech space, you, you might be wanting a patent attorney, particularly with computer engineering, uh, computer science technical background but when we're talking generally um, about law and generally about corporate structures and generally about IP and copyright and every everything else um, ideally what you're going to need is a is a multi-practice group of team of lawyers with expertise in all those areas and like patent attorneys you can it's it's, it's not a problem to call up a lawyer and say this is what I'm this is this is my what we're doing what do you recommend? And then the lawyer will give a quote for their services, or they might say they'll charge from, from day one. Um, others, others will generally are meant to give you a quote um, for the services. So there's no harm in going and speaking to various IP lawyers and for different firms to find a lawyer that you really, um, really trust and really feel that you can get the best advice and can work with you. Um, so in other words, do not fear lawyers. There's lots and lots of good ones out there. It's just a matter of finding the correct fit for your, for your, for your business. Yeah. And I've mentioned that, sorry, I'm gonna jump in. I, I mentioned that at the, I think one of the last sessions in the IP strategy and probably reiterated it and a few others, but um, is finding that that service provider that will go on the journey with you and, and DLA Piper is one of those firms that they do specialise in the startup world, um, you know, so they, they have that understanding of what the needs are and what the, the type of clients um, a startup is quite different from the big corporate multinationals. So, um, so it's very good. Yeah, exactly. So, Rosie, sorry, I'll just add one more thing to that. Oh, it's good. It's, good. But, it's, good. But, but it's really that just because the firms are large firms, I mean, DLA is a one of the largest global or the largest global law firms but just because it's large doesn't mean that the fees are going to be higher than elsewhere you know ultimately with the global reach you're going to get better value for money because you're going to have a team of global lawyers working 
to um, protect your uh, business globally. Mm-hmm. And um, that that is really valuable. And, you know, it's it, it, whether it's more expensive or it's not more expensive, it, it really is you, you get what you need to you know it's important to to get the quality advice to, and uh the, the larger law firms aren't always necessarily more expensive so don't be put off um by mm-hmm. by that 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 um reputation and, and eliza unlike patterns i mean if you start using your invention you you know very few countries have grace periods so you can't go back and plug the hole as I said but there's some things I you know my experience with Neutromics that in the legal world you know it's having that plan there's some things that you go this is how ideally I want to set up my company but you can do it in stages or even if you've done the wrong thing go back and have it fixed so to speak Um, so that's why it's you know the more knowledge the client has with what they're thinking and taking that that service provider on the journey to say well this is what I need now, but this is where I'm going. They can help set you up along the way. And, and that's, I, I find that, you know, I've spoken to other startups and other clients when I was in a profession and, you know, not, not saying, you know, wanting to be bad, but, you know, rushing into it and then going, oh, but this is what I wanted. But unless they take you on that journey, you can't help them plan along um, and help them use their resources wisely. Exactly. Because, yeah, we're talking tech, it's, it's, most of the time always going to be global and uh, a lot of the time we will advise clients on um, we will give them a quote for example on the entry into different jurisdictions so say for example it's telehealth um, the advice on giving them advice in in multiple jurisdictions and then they might choose a jurisdiction um, in, you know, the legal advice might be cheaper in a particular jurisdiction, so they might choose to launch their product or service first into a jurisdiction where they can test the market and, and get the advice and, and test the market uh, earlier. Uh, so, yeah, global advice is, is really critical, I, I think, for, um, for startup health tech companies. No, a couple of people in the Talking Health Tech community who kind of go the other way they're still global but they've got say head office in another location in another part of the world and there's a little remote person here in Australia representing mm-hmm. a much larger organization in another part of the world and they I've I've had my own experience with that arrangement too where sometimes it can feel like you know if there's a lawyer in the US for example providing generalized advice to try and cover in Australia like your advice to the kind of first person or one of the first people on the ground you know in in Australia for an organization that's more more global Eliza I'm expecting you probably work with um, with organizations in that kind of structure as well uh, yeah 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 absolutely we, we advise um, a, a lot of get yeah, startups in other countries. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll provide, at the end of the day, we'll provide the advice on entering into the Australian market. But a lot of it's this early strategy advice. Mm. And we'll have the global team, we'll have the US lawyers and lawyers in Australia and Europe all advising this client at the early stage uh, as to all the different, how to navigate all the different legal issues mm. in multiple jurisdictions. And I guess how do you how do you go about deciding how much is like oversharing and too early to, in terms of lawyering up versus um, versus you know doing the right ju- you know due diligence and getting your, your your bits in in pieces early? I guess you know we've covered a little bit of that already, but um, any kind of to, to close out that kind of thought for for those earlier stage founders looking to get the right advice. Yeah, look. It, would, it, would, it should always really be up to the client. Um, the client will be informed. These are the legal issues. Um, these, the, you know, these are the jurisdictions, and this is how much it costs for, for the advice. And then the client will select a few. And really, it, 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 it's the, it, it's not so much that the lawyers will will sort of direct the client, but the client will be given the law and and the, the issues in different jurisdictions. And it really will be them to make the, up to them to make the commercial decision. Mm. Uh, as to where they're going is that what you were you were asking yeah a little bit it's just it's just finding that balance and I think we we 
kind of already covered it, you know, in terms of the allocating scarce resources at the right time of the, the, the period and, and just choosing which areas you invest your time. And I think Rosie also touched on that too, with, you know, choosing some areas now and then prioritizing later, but having those conversations early, you can have a lot of those conversations without investing a great deal of money. Um, yeah, I think it's the, you know, try and be informed as much as possible. Ask the questions. Don't take it as gospel. Um, and if they say something you don't know, because it is a different speak, so is the pattern world. Um, yeah, ask, ask the questions and ask, you know, you've given me this document, is, is it just applicable here? Is it applicable overseas? Um, yeah, if you're going to need multiple of that document, like a confidentiality agreement, ask them for a template version and what paragraphs or what clauses you may need to edit. So you're getting one document, but you've learned how to use it and where, you know, the limitations of using it for different scenarios mm. to try and help mm. with the cost. It is, it, it, look, Peter, it's hard because, you know, startups may not have lots of funds and, and or resources, people, you know, within the company. Um, but it is important um, because IP, there's lots of stories where the IP has saved the day. You know, that was, you know, a, the tangible asset of the company. You can have a great idea, but if you... You walk out there and it's not protected someone else will snap it up and that's that's the sad thing about it so and and you know we've talked about i think in the previous two sessions is finding those good collaborators and research partners that you know may help you along and bear the burden look we'll um open up for any questions that uh for people attending if they do have them um and there's yeah i can't see the guests i've got a small view here oh, no, it's okay no they, they we've got but i was gonna gonna say if they've got some questions i'm interested to know they've attended the session if they've got you know their experience in the ip legal world um if they have any comments that we can yeah respond to all good people are probably eating lunch too and <laughs> But look, um, I think as well, what we'll do, because we've I got the link, Eliza, for those resources that you mentioned. I put the link for that in the chat here. I'll also make it available with the recording too for people to check out um, if they want to access them and if they've got questions, they can reach out there. Um, we'll have the recordings from this session available for, for members and those that attended as well. To watch back and we'll have the slides from the sessions one to four um, all there too so all of these resources are there available and like rosie and eliza have suggested ask the questions and there's not silly questions i think as well from you know my own personal experience it can be sometimes especially if you you know this is your first business or if you know early in the process and actually it doesn't even have to be your first or early it's still Engaging any professional, it can be daunting at times and sometimes there's egos get in the way where you might like think that there's assumed knowledge that you need to have in dealing with them, but ask the, ask the basic questions and um, get your protections right from the, from the outset. I think that's some of the key messages that have come out of this and hopefully the sessions that we've run over the past 10 weeks, I think one every two or three weeks that would provide people with that confidence and insights to point them in the right direction. So unless there are any other final comments or questions from people who've attended live, and if not any other final comments or questions from the speakers as well, I can see here. Um, there is a comment. Matthew, I apologize. What? Matthew Shah has asked if it's not a novel innovation so in the context of a telehealth startup is ip mandatory well math, math I, I appreciate the question so if it's not a novel in innovation um then you know ip is not mandatory because you may not be able to seek patent protection um or at least patent protection there might be other types of protection you could you could seek um and I think Eliza pointed out before, it's like, you know, if there's no protection available to you for what you have, you've got to get to the, the market first and maybe come up with a different type of strategy to, to steal the market away, like a good branding strategy around what you have so that people recognise <clears throat> this is my innovation. So, um, 
So if someone takes it, they may bring out an inferior type of version. But, you know, people, you know, you've got to build up your reputation around it, I would think. Eliza, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, um, telehealth is, is really, uh, if it's simply just the provision of medical services by a healthcare professional online um, in, into another country or, or into the same country, there's not really any IP at all uh, as far as patents that, that I can think of um, unless there's some, some advancement or improvement in, in, in computer technology, which, so in the interface of the computer, there might be something, more. But, but just our standard telehealth that we know of, um, there's, it's, it's, it's the legal issues that I'm, that we consider a lot are, are, are more related to the data. So if it's overseas, if it's a, if it's a doctor giving advice from the US into mm. the Philippines or, or, or some rare location, some other location, there, 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 there'll be issues uh, around data protection and the transfer of health data across, across borders. Uh, so that, that's, the main, that's the main issues, but also other, another big issue um, for startups in those contexts in telehealth is will the provision of healthcare services be subsidised by the particular government where the patient is located or, and or will it be covered by private health insurance and those sorts of things. Uh, so, yeah, from an IP perspective, you'd be looking at branding, your, your copyright, in, if you've got a, a page um, over which you provide the services. But, yeah, unless there's real, a real um, technical advancement in, in the way um, the computer's used to deliver the services to the patient, um, it, it, there's not much patentable subject matter. And it's not so much that it's... I mean, no IP is mandatory. It is a patentable invention. It's you, you seek IP protection um, under legislative, you know, acts because it helps you to, to then enforce it. If you get those rights, you can go to court and enforce them. I mean, just the fact that you've brought something out, you might not have any rights to stop others. And that's why, you know, people seek IP because it, and it you know, gives you the right to stop others, really. Um, so, yeah, so... It's just you don't want to spend all this time and money producing something and then if it could have been protected, protect it because if someone you know, might just come along and take it away. Mm. That's right, Rosie. And if, if it, just because tech's involved, technology and computers are involved, doesn't mean there's going to be IP. It's really just a medium over which mm. standard services um, that we've, we've all received all our lives are, are delivered. Um, so there may not be anything patentable in it. But on telehealth, thank you very much for that question. D Another guide I have for you, uh, Peter, is um, a DLA Piper a guide to navigating telehealth laws around the world, which has oh, been cool. a very, very um, useful guide uh, in, for multiple jurisdictions. It sets out the law in multiple jurisdictions and whether telehealth it is per se even available. Hmm. Um, uh, as a, as a service in in various countries so uh i'll give that to peter to provide the link yeah. to that also so peter, and I'll, I'll just put in just from being in the startup world there's two things it's like you know you look you asked about resources and you know where can you go and if you find like dla piper have these and you know they're up to date and sometimes they'll be dated and if then if they if you do find a resource and don't you can't see the date because, as Eliza said, there can be changes over time and our internet is, I'm not very technological, our internet is full of stuff. Um, if you find stuff, that you can ring the firm and say, look, I've got that brochure that's on there, you know, when was it done? Is it still current? And, and you know, you won't get charged for it, I would hope, but um, just don't give me your credit card details. Um, so, you know, find out how relevant it is as well. Just be wary that you're not, you know, finding out some information and it's not up to date. I have, you know, being on the inside and I'm a patent attorney, not a lawyer, you know, trying to find stuff and going, oh, actually, I, you know, 
that's not quite up to date, but it's still sitting there, you know, no one's updated it. So be wary of that. And the other thing, you know, being in the startup world, um, the community is great. Um, you know, as long as it's not a conflict of interest, you can reach out to other startups and go, hey, how have you gone about doing this? How have you done that? And, you know, people are always willing to help. Well, my experience, you know, help along the way. So, um, so it's been great, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to give back. Love it. Well, thank you, Rosie, Eliza. There's been some um, thank you comments in the chat as well. So um, I might, I reckon we will wrap this session up. We've done it in good time. I think we've we've summarised the key points well, and we've got those previous sessions for people to dive into if they wanted to, as well as um, both your details if they wanted to reach out further and ask any more questions. So Eliza and Rosie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you. for having us. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.